Welcome, citizens of Gotham City and the outlying suburbs of Bloodhaven and Tricorner to episode 93, wow, of I Am The Night. And this week we're covering season three, episode 15, Cult of the Cat. And of course, this is a Mr. Freeze episode. No, it's not. I got you. What is it about and who stars in this one, Adam? Uh, this is the first appearance of Dogman, of all things. Uh, I'm very excited to see him. No, this is a, another Selina Kyle classic, and as a long-standing reviewer of Catwoman, she's quickly become one of my personal favourite characters in all of DC. And this episode's given us a good insight into Miss Selina and how she what, handles herself in the bigger, wider, and I'd say weirder world of Gotham mm. City that we see in this episode. But uh, we'll unpack it all in a good long minute, won't we? Yeah. Absolutely. And this actually is an amazing Catwoman episode, but we'll, we'll come yeah. into that. It's written by uh, Paul Dini and Stan Berkovich with a script by Stan Berkovich, obviously two of the greats, and directed by another legend, Butch Lukic. And from the start, from the beautiful vistas of her escaping these cat ninjas through this bluey green maze with red skies, I mean, it's beautifully directed and, and, and very well animated. What do you think of it from the get go? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm always a sucker for a hedge maze. So seeing that as the opener just gives like a little bit of intrigue and mystery and a lot of places to dodge and weave and get lost. So I made for a very action packed opening. Um, I hadn't thought about the colors until you just pointed them out. But yeah, they're good, dramatic, bold color contrasts. They're just made for a huge and exciting set piece that uh, definitely makes it memorable for the, for the opening visuals. And yeah, seeing multiple cat dressed people, especially with the the claw gauntlet sort of deals, is um is very is a very exciting way to open and we have to wonder what the deal is. But of course we find out who these cat ninjas are as the episode unfolds. But strong opener, strong action packs, swashbuckling right away. And vintage Selena, because she's fighting against much higher odds. I mean, there's like a dozen of them and, and just her, and she more than holds her own, even though they've got, like you said, the massive claws and so this is a very Selena centric episode and she's at her absolute best. But I wanted to ask you, being our resident Catwoman reviewer every month. Now, we know that when she was introduced in this series, she was blonde to, um, you know, imitate the Michelle Pfeiffer Batman Returns Catwoman. And there's a comic book episode in the Batman Adventures where she says, um, well, basically, they come across a very evil uh, makeup uh, entrepreneur. And she said, oh, I can't believe I use this woman's products to dye my hair. And this episode, she's in standard short hair, um, Selena, that we all know and love. But the black costume, the pale makeup and her gift, shall we say, with the felines she encounters in this episode, I'm getting a really strong Batman Returns vibe from her. Yeah, one of my biggest notes from this episode was uh, that uh, her cat whispering is very strong in this episode because right here at the beginning, we see her sort of like almost like Game of Thrones style warg or like Vulcan mind meld with this Jaguar. And then we see her do it again with a much bigger and meaner cat later in the episode. Um, I honestly really liked this take. I liked the take of the almost supernatural connection of Cowman sort of connecting with cats. It's not something that's explored very much. Um, obviously, I think they try to favor her to be a little bit more like down the middle and a bit more of like the noir DC's greatest thief sort of archetype. Yeah. And that's, that's totally okay too. So it's good that there's multiple ways that such a classic character can be interpreted. So you can see her as this like um, cat burglar, uh, grease monkey finesse sort of person, or you can see her as this like partly primordial supernatural. And again, even in the early episodes of this show, we saw her as this uh, defender of nature and this um, champion for animal rights. So all of them speak to Catwoman's roots, but some of them are, have uh, been used more than others in certain kinds of stories, but that doesn't make them any less valid or real interpretations. So, yeah, I think it's welcome here. And with the look of like the of the all black with the ears slightly to an angle and yeah. the pale is like it's very creepy and it adds to like the Michelle Pfeiffer look without being the Michelle Pfeiffer bro blonde. So yeah, this is a definitely a valid take, and I'm glad you brought up the um the story from the the Avengers comics because. I hope that, um, well, I hope uh, it's probably true that the inspiration of dyeing my hair blonde from a sinister makeup company probably influenced the the plot of the god awful Pete of Halle Berry movie. 
Well, yeah, I mean, let's less said about that the better. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, she says yeah, that, that um, I use this woman's products for years. I even used it to dye my hair, and now that explains why she's gone back to the classic Celine look, the hair blonde. Well, Michelle Pfeiffer isn't blonde, so that actually makes sense in that context as well. But I'm really glad you said that you like that take on Catwoman because I think, and we say this a lot about Batman, that this animated series does cover every aspect of Batman. And I think it's doing the same with Catwoman. It's taking that different, never before seen, slightly supernatural origin that we saw in Batman Returns and melding it and marrying it to the vintage Catwoman that we all know and love. Definitely. There's um there's so much of there that's still recognizably Catwoman, the look, the skill set, and the desire to steal things. I think it's important to emphasize the differences and emphasize the kind of stories that each creator wants to tell with each Catwoman. So as long as they get the fundamentals down, they can take a lot of artistic licenses with the whole cat whispering, with the supernatural element, and with um the uh the animal rights sort of side of things so there's a character like that that's been around for nearly as long as batman there's multitudes of stories you could tell absolutely 1940 we first saw catwoman so only a year less than batman so there you go um 84 years next year so let's then talk about what you just said her skill set because in this episode she blew my mind she gets away from the cat sanctuary from the thieves from the ninjas and next thing we see is Batman apprehending a couple of goons uh, wearing ski masks because it's a fashion statement. Sure, sure. It is. And where does he find her? In the car. She broke into the Batmobile. I mean, yeah. world's greatest thief. Wow. I mean, that kind of proves it. I mean, we've seen Batman, the Batmobile, like armor itself up in Batman Returns. We've seen it armor itself up and defend itself in this show. So for anyone to get past that, they're they're not to be messed with they are very she's very powerful very skilled in what she has to do but i also love the fact that batman kind of takes it in stride she's just like oh right you're here that was gonna be the next point it's it's a it's a good indication of what their rapport will go into it's clearly love as far as i'm concerned but none of them want to admit it Mm. but well again we'll talk about it when we come to it because the he saves she saves bit in this episode is just terrific it's it's brilliant and you don't know like a cat you don't know which way she's going to go you, you can't um ever second guess a cat the greatest saying is uh, dogs come when called cats will take a message and maybe get back to you and this is it you don't know which way she's going to go this year she attacks batman she saves batman and, and vice versa and, it, and it's brilliant isn't it oh truly we get them sort of like tip the tooting as it were just like trying to recognize each other's skills but without ever actually admitting their interest there's there's so much love and respect there but they're not going to admit it because ultimately they're still on the opposite sides of the law uh we know that in the current comics continuity catwoman's much more of an anti-hero these days uh running her own uh community of misfits out of a very dingy part of gotham and to call a part of gotham specifically dingy is a is a reward um so that kind of early look at their dynamic, I think, is the thing that is the saving grace. Because with these new takes on Catwoman, you could go too far. You could put in some new spins that are just so totally not the character. But that fundamental relationship, as long as up there with the look and what her motives are, as things that define Catwoman. So as long as they got that down, it's great. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Tell you what else is great. This isn't another one of those episodes where we get a lot of character, but we get some classic action. Now, let's talk about that chase with the Batmobile mm. and the cat ninjas on the motorbikes behind him. I love the blown tire instant Re-split. replace bit. How yeah. cool was that? I also made that note. I thought it was so good that it's just like, oh, okay, cool. So he never has a flat tire. Just like he must have like multiple spares just ready to go and it just like auto deploys itself. So there must be like some sort of other wheel sort of in the middle to keep the balance while it redoes that. But uh, we've we've met the the architect and the uh, mechanic that's built the Batmobile. So I think that that a dude like that is capable of designing anything. So a lovely, lovely little twist of uh, realism there. And again, you read my mind. The whole bit you just said with the wheel in the middle. Obviously, remember the Bat Rocket from Batman Returns. I think where 
Batman's driving the Batmobile and he's got nowhere to go and there's only this narrow alley and then the two sides of the Batmobile go and it drives like a motorbike with two wheels on the centre. So I think that's exactly what's happened. Mm. It's got spare wheels on the sides which deploy and it uses the centre wheel when that happens. So great minds, bud. Great minds. They really do. And now let's talk about when they get to her place. And I don't know if you spotted it because it's magic. So they drive to Selena's place to get some things because he talks her into giving away everything she's ever robbed to protect her from the ninjas. But there was, in one corner of her apartment, the Shrek cat from Batman Returns, the smiley yeah. Felix yes. the cat thing. Did you spot it? Yes, I did. Great. It was, um, yeah, so... It's probably like licensed differently, or it's probably just like a different knickknack that cat uh, that Selena kept because it's a smiley cat face. But um, I'm sure it was put there as a lovely little design choice to be like, yes, that's that's a callback to this. If you get it, you get it. If not, it's just another thing that fits the aesthetic. So yeah, it was a pleasant surprise to see. It's just a lovely little bit of storytelling and writing, isn't it? Yeah. Or maybe the animators put it in. We don't know really, do we? I mean, either way, it's just one part of the immense and deeply talented creative team recognising another great Batman work. And another great piece of action, because obviously the ninjas, because they're ninjas, track Selina and Batman to her digs. And (sighs) the only way out is through the furnace. And I knew something bad was coming as soon as she said it was the furnace. So they're climbing up. And of course, in comes Thomas Blake, who long-time comic fans will know will one day be the cat man mm. and um lights the furnace and boom Woof. whoosh i mean great piece of action right oh yeah it's a old school almost like pulp peril moment like um i almost liken it to the great big boulder at the beginning of the indiana jones um just that threat just looming up coming to get you and but batman remains cool the whole way through and just grapple hooks the way up and out but uh things go a little wrong when he's sort of like knows the city so well he's able to catch himself on that ledge but like a big explosion like that still left them reeling so well they trap if uh, by the bad guys i would say boom and out they fly landing um i'm sorry like a cat on a hot tin roof. I apologise. Uh, please, oh, Tennessee Williams me. is an American classic. <laughs> but I just had to use that line in this particular oh, yeah. particular moment. But what I really love is the next bit because obviously they capture Selena, but obviously some of the cat ninjas are obviously training behind. And that shot mm. with Batman leaping off the roof. This is why the dude has a cape. Yes, yep. it's impractical. Yes, it's probably dangerous. But damn, when he glides down on the roof to land on that motorcyclist, how sick does that look? That was going to be my big takeaway of the episode. Just like that's, we've seen Batman swoop in uh, and like take down bad guys in practically every medium. I know that there's like, it's a big mechanic of like the stealthy missions in the Arkham games that I finally was able to get for uh, in a good remaster. But um, I think it's the first time, at least that I can think of, where you get the perspective of the goons, of where you see Batman swooping in towards you. I think the other good time of that was probably with those neon punks in Batman Forever. But yeah. uh, just that visual of Batman swooping into towards you, you really get a sense of just how terrifying a sight like that is. So it's a great visual moment that I'm glad has been finally put to screen so well. Archetype. Yeah. iconic and archetypal it's vintage batman but so is the following scenes i mean does he take this guy back to the bat cave because if he does that's so smart because this is terrifying the way he gets the information of where the cat ninjas are mm. is borderline like it's amazing he, he has this guy on the precipice he says you like cats meet my favorite animal then a swarm of bats and then the guy takes a drop and batman catches him with a grapple at the last minute and it's it obviously that's how batman terrifies his, his yeah. enemies and it also shows like another amazing feat of strength of batman that he could lift, lift a, a fully grown right. athletic muscular ninja dude just by pulling on a rope like this and doesn't even have like a real or like the grapple hook it's batman it's batman Ooh, that's it's why we batman. love him so um now there's a couple of other characters obviously we've got thomas blake of course and we'll talk about him and the the actor that plays him but he's also got a sidekick a oh, yeah, female a cat ninja who is pretty mean and pretty awesome mm. and um 
it's brilliant to see them introduce new characters and they do it so well in this show that fit the billing because I always said that Catman's underrated character didn't really come into his own, even though he's been around for decades until um, the late years, the 90s onwards. But why have they never given him a proper cat ninja black costume like they did in this show? Because this is a much better look than the one orange and yellow that we're used to seeing him in the comics, particularly in the 60s and 70s. I suppose, like, because it's the 60s and 70s, they were able to go a little bit campy with brighter colours. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's definitely a product of the time. But uh, I think if he were, I'm not sure if he's a uh, uh, staple of the comics these days, but if he were to be reintroduced, I would hope that whoever was writing and designing him would put him in a look similar to this. I think the thing that would um, maybe make them hesitant to that would be he'd be too much of a visual contrast to Black Panther of Marvel Comics. Very good point. Very, very good point. I mean, for many years as a child, I didn't even know Black Panther was Black Panther. I just thought it was Batman in a different costume. Um, but I was a kid. What what did I know? And um, that's probably part of the reason I love Black Panther so much. But um, anyway, we digress. This is the that's the other company we're talking about on this yeah, show. But um that's all our this, favorite. Yeah. This cat ninja lady has a fantastic moment with Selena. So she's obviously she's jealous because Blake um, clearly sees in Selena what their entire cult is about. I mean, this is a cult that worships cats and is a den of thieves. And she says it herself that she was born to be part of this, whether she knew it or not. But this lady ninja says that she's just a common thief and wonderful Selena and I know I'm a spectacular thief. And we know that's what you feel about her. Oh, no, definitely. I'm trying my best to sort of like... She's not doing as much these days because I appreciate the character growth, but I personally believe that she's uh, she owns owns the moniker Greatest Thief in DC Comics. It's uh, sort of a callback to a character from one of my true loves, Magic the Gathering, who's uh, the character actually died in uh, the War of the Spark storyline, but Dak Faden was always considered the greatest thief of the multiverse. I think that true rogue uh, swashbuckler who can go in, take the gem, and go out before the before anyone even realizes there's something really remarkable there and something memorable there so any character that earns greatest at something has to be like really memorable and i think catwoman deserves a title like this from the years of years she's been around into like her skills and the varying kinds of stories she's told why not and you coined that and i think it's about time because batman's a dark knight the cape crusader he's part of the dynamic duo superman's the man of steel the man of tomorrow the last son of krypton catwoman deserves to have that moniker dc's greatest thief i think that's that's fantastic and it, and it fits her but um catman's pretty awesome in himself i mean he gives batman a fight in this episode right Oh no, he really does. I mean, he's on a, from looking at the infrastructure of this cult that he's leading. Uh, he's on a similar level of wealth and means to Bruce Wayne, and on a similar level of fighting style to Bruce and uh, fighting skill to Bruce Wayne. Um, I think like his zealotry is what's making him so misguided, but that's to be expected. Uh, as a viewer, I've got to say it's a great to see yet another sinister English villain stroking a or bright white cat very below. Right. Films. That was going to be the, one of my takeaways, the Bond thing. <laughs> the Bond thing. But um, I think that just all adds up to a very unique, uh, very very memorable character that I think could be reskinned in current comics just to keep up that level of uh, visual strength. I'm sure they could do some justice with him soon. Oh, I hope so, because he's a, he's a cool character. And I, I just want to say one more thing about Selena, because there's some vintage moments. When Bruce uh, gets the info out of the goon and tracks her down to the villain's lair, and he, he literally walks in with her using a pillowcase as a swag bag to steal even more from the people who already want her dead. And I just think that is so typically vintage. Don't give a monkey's Selena Carl Calderon. I just think it's really funny that she's there with the pillowcase filling up with stuff, but then like when Batman walks in, she's just like, uh, nothing, and then just coy hides it behind her back, as if that's gonna do anything. It's wonderful, isn't it? So Absolutely. charming, so fun, yeah. Right. So obviously they get to the end, and obviously we saw a Jaguar at the beginning when I thought Selena's gift. But then Thomas Blake is clearly, like you said, a man of means. His wealth does parallel Bruce's in the comics, and actually now it probably outweighs it because Bruce is no longer a billionaire after the Joker War. Mm. But um, Thomas Blake has had a saber-toothed tiger 
brought back in the present. And once again, Selena controls this thing and it protects her, just like um, Blake's cat attacks anyone who, who messes with her. She has got, like you said, cat whisperer abilities. It doesn't even cut it. She's literally like a cat woman, for want of a better term. <laughs> yeah, she's got some sort of affinity for cats in this episode, which is a very interesting sort of thing to see. I um, I just hope that it's something that uh, they might be able to bring through but otherwise, it's a, uh, it's a, it's an interesting one. I'm I'm glad they were able to do something with it. I, uh, yeah, it's just another element of the character that calls back to Batman Returns and the strange supernatural freaky side of things. But uh, if they do it well in stories like this, then it's something I would like to see more of. Absolutely. Whilst balancing her as like this skillful and strange new uh, powerful thief. I'd love to see a. Ocean's Eleven style heist movie by Warner Brothers with Catwoman and maybe some of the Birds of Prey um, in that fun. kind of thing. That'd be amazing. That'd be fun because uh, the um, the Ocean's Ocean's Eight the the remake with Sandy I enjoyed B that. Is, yeah, yeah, with Sandy B as um, George Clooney's little sister. That was really good and like a good uh, good female led heist movie's not really been done before. So getting one with those characters in that energy would be a lot of fun. So yeah, I, I, I'd enjoy that. Maybe yeah, maybe not necessarily the birds of prey. Maybe the sirens. Yeah, they're Gotham a bit, City yeah, sirens. Yeah, they're you, a bit more um, sinister and more inclined to pull a heist. So they did your Ivies and your Harleys. Yeah, good call. Like that. So on that note, let's talk about the guest actors in the show. And I'll actually start in reverse this time because um, Lady Ninja's credits actually outweigh um, Mister Blake's in this episode, okay. but still no small shakes as as anyone will know that's the same of anyone who appears in this show um thomas blake the cat man was played by scott cleverden a scots actor believe it or not um uh, mainly known for video games and for um animation um stuff like m- many of the star wars video games um gargoyles um yeah. Batman Beyond, he'll appear again in that. Um, he was carnage throughout the entire Spider-Man the Animated Series. Ooh. So huge geek uh, nerd cred. But he's done TV and movies as well. Beverly Hills 90210, Baywatch Nights. And he was um, in The Borgers, the show you watched with Mama. He was Gonzalo oh. Fernandez. Oh, wow. I don't know if yeah. you remember the character. Uh, very loosely. I think he was sort of a, um, he was started out as like a, an ally to the Pope and uh, to mm. Cesare and then started to get a bit sinister to help parlay through. So, yeah, uh, good to see like an actor, actor taking his yeah. uh, um, voice talents to a slice of history. Absolutely. The, the, the proper presence and a great voice for the episode. I thought really, really Definitely. good. Like you said, the vintage British bad guy. Um, yep. Love it. And let's talk about Tazia Valencia. You may recognize the name because she's actually been in this show before. She played um, the character Mariam in the Baby Doll episode, but she's oh, back okay. again in the bigger role. I mean, again, um, I didn't tell all this stuff last time because I had a feeling she'd be back, and here she is. She will be back in Batman Beyond. Um, mm. She's been in shows like The Bold and the Beautiful. Cheers. Um, she was in the A team. She won an Emmy for her role in All My Children, um, Space Above and Beyond, Arkham Asylum, and the Spider Man games as every villain S or hench person, a uh, female villain in both those games. Appeared in episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Wars The Bad Batch, and Star Wars The Clone Wars. This is Shark T. Oh, wow. One, yeah. of, my, one of my favorite je- je- underappreciated, underappreciated like, B tier Jedi. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So, Tazia Valenza, we salute you. And once again, the power of uh, Andrea Romano's casting um, hits a home run. Uh, n- knows no bounds. Definitely, definitely a pleasant surprise. Wow. Um, great. It's great to see uh, such talents out there. Um, and once again, people of like like high gravitas to be here in like relatively small parts. But then again, there's no small parts. They, this yeah. character clearly made a a great impact. Yeah, and with the fact that she'll be back again in uh, Batman Beyond clearly shows that she's a favourite with the the casting team. So, yeah, that was Cult of the Cats, episode fifteen of season three, and we've had a few people 
uh, send us tweets and messages saying that um, how come the order that we're doing the show doesn't match the broadcast order. And again, this is from reading the brilliant Batman animated book by Chip Kidd. Um, when the Blu-ray was released, yes, this isn't the order they were broadcasting, but this is the order that the writers, producers and directors wanted the show to go in, the order that makes the best sense logically and in terms of storytelling. So we're going to follow the Blu-ray disc order because that's the order the creators wanted. So, yes, there is a slight difference to the DVD version and the versions um, when they were released on television, but we're going to go by what the creator said because they made the show. So that's yeah. the that's the reason behind that yeah we just want to honor the way that the creators wanted to put out the show and don't worry if you have a favorite episode we're going to cover all of them so we will get there listeners i promise absolutely so adam um your main takeaways even though you've talked about most of them from cult of the cat well yeah we talked about um the actual great visual of Batman swooping down but i wanted to talk about a really niche sort of uh bit that i had to do a, a bit that i'd heard but then a bit that i had to sort of research which is that final moment that final image of selena going back on her word and just lounging around some luxury penthouse apartment in paris with all of the stuff that she stole and she's there with her pet cat isis and she asks isis uh, beautiful cat and she asks uh, her cat all right what do you want to eat beluga or savruga and i googled it beluga is a kind of whale meat uh, well, it's kind of whale, and therefore it's eating whale meat. And savruga, the is, most expensive caviar in the world as well. Savruga, yes, no, 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 beluga is whale, but savruga is the most expensive, is is very expensive caviar. So, what kind of money had Selena been pulling down since she left Batman and found herself in Paris to be able to give the most expensive food imaginable to her cat? Honestly, amazing. Such a little niche moment that just really reflects on the character so well. And it's very, very close to what I was going to mention because. Right at the end, obviously, Selena goes free, um, but the whole conversation a bruised and battered Batman mm. sitting at the back of the ambulance, talking to his best friend, Jim Gordon, and Batman said, obviously, oh, you've got all the evidence you need to put them behind bars. He says, oh, there's probably enough to convict them, but there was a lot less then than we were expecting. And of course, oh, oh, it's, where did it... it's Selena's apartment. Of course, where did it go? Who knows? But then again, for her to be able to like get in a life or death fight with a giant yeah. mutant cat and supervillains and also help out Batman multiple times in that fight and then have enough time to slink away and steal all that kinds of stuff. That's why I believe she's DC's great Steve. And would you agree that the fact she only steals from the people who can afford to be stolen from and the rich and the corrupt makes her okay in my book? Oh no, that's definitely fine. And I think that attitude helps influence her anti-hero stance that we've got seeing these days because she's just a very uh a very kicky leather clad robin hood kind of spot on is exactly what she is well said and a great note to end on and because you say great things let our viewers let our listeners know where else they can hear you say great things write great things and do great things in general I'm widespread across the great wide interwebs for DC comics flavored things. Look no further than Dark Knight News, where I review Catwoman and many other multiple titles a month. Uh, as of the time of recording of this episode, you can find me on the latest episode of the DC Comics News podcast talking about the uh, most exciting DC flavored news it's of out. the week. It's a, it was an f- absolute blast. I'm sure my dear old father and the, and the lovely Brad will ex- accept it for me to give my two cents on the news of the day if i'm welcome back anytime soon you betcha but uh, as for my one true love pc and tabletop gaming look no further than our pride and joy fantasticuniverses.com where i give my two cents on trading card games pc gaming console gaming and whatever new board game expansion i've been able to treat myself at whatever small game store here in great london town Follow me on Twitter at IsItTinkerer and follow me on twitch.tv forward slash IsItTinkerer where with some time framing up soon, I'll be able to put myself to a uh, regular streaming schedule to streaming DC Dual Force and whatever online collectible card game I can find myself doing. But yes, uh, the best way to talk to me is to do uh, 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 twitter.com forward slash IsItTinkerer to be up there somewhere. I still call it Twitter. Uh, the supervillain will not rename it that much. No. I like tweeting and Twitter, not excreting and X. Sorry, I'm not. No, it's Twitter. Um, I'm going to. 
go back to the point. And you can catch me there at el underscore s t e e v o. Catch DC Comics News at DC Comics News, Dark Knight News at DK News Com, and Fantastic Universes at Fan Universes. This show and the DC Comics News podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and of course on YouTube now, where you can see Gotham City in the background and our lovely, gorgeous, heroic faces too. Until you do. That's Adam Ray. They are the night. Together, we are the night. And this has been the I Am The Night podcast. Thank you for listening. And until next time, read more comics and watch more. That's magic.